How many people did the blender survey? Pretty much everybody? Okay, so we're going to start this. I want to have a little bit of a contest. We're going to have a smackdown here. And the smackdown is to try to decide who can design or which team. We're going to divide you into four teams. And the objective here is to design a blender that makes your team the most money. So I'm going to pass out a worksheet here. You can't see it here. But what you have to do is you have to, if you can call, recall back, and they're written on here, there were eight different attributes that you were allowed to choose for this blender. How big the jar was, what it was made out of, how many speeds it had, what finish it is. So your team needs to select one of those features, one of those levels for each one of these features. You need to select how big you want your jar to be, what material you want it to be made out of, what finish you want it to be. The thing is that each one of those features has a price associated with it. So if you pick the cheapest of all of your features, your blender is going to end up costing 15 bucks. If you want to add a glass jar to it, it's going to cost you another $5. So your team real quickly is going to pick the features you want. That's going to add up to a cost. And then your team has to decide what you want to sell this blender for, a price. The difference between those two, my blender out here I picked ended up costing 25 bucks. I said I wanted a 56 ounce jar. I wanted a stainless steel jar, contemporary styling, three speeds, colored plastic, a dial, and no programming. And that ended up costing me 25 bucks. And I thought, you know, I'm going to price my blender at $49.99. I mean, I'm going to make $24 for every blender I sell. So your objective is to pick the feature set that makes your team the most money. So I want to just grab this group right here. There's a sample in the back. Right. Can we price our blenders? You, yes, you can price anything you want. Why don't you grab your real, this group kind of right here? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. We all filled out that. This group right here. That's right. Yeah, no, no, we, we all filled out You guys can do right here. So just take a couple of minutes. You can make a big deal out of it. Don't call me. The more you price your blender, odds are the less you're going to sell. If you haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> that's, that's sort of capitalism. So you could price your blender at $1,000, and you're welcome to do that. You might even sell a couple. So we do everything. All right, so you guys are probably starting to get a little bit of the hint of a little bit of all this time that's going on. I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. Our objective is not to teach you necessarily how to do a conjoint, but I want to talk about what it is, how it works, what types of information. You've probably heard us talking about conjoint lately, and then we're going to complete our blender smack down and see which one of us can, can win, which one of the Hey, you have a little problem. Now, in your solution, our style choices are classic and temporary and functional. Yeah. Funky's modern. Whoa. No. Oh. Oh. It's a class, people. <laughs> we change our answer. Okay, fine, fine. I can tell the class has diminished importance. It's all about the competition. <laughs> okay, so what is conjoint? It's a quantitative research technique. Really interestingly enough, it was proposed by mathematicians in 1964, but it wasn't until the early 70s that computer power and techniques became sufficient to really drive this forward. Conjoint is what's called a predictive analysis technique versus descriptive. By that, it means we're going to try to predict how consumers would behave, how they would choose products. That's different than conventional survey techniques, which tend to be descriptive, asking people to describe how they would behave in particular solutions. So what does Conjoint do? One of the, the first things that Conjoint does that we struggle with the, with some of the qualitative research we do is it handles trade-offs. A lot of you heard, heard me tell the story that used to be a, a Madison area pizza franchise that had this tagline, would you like more cheese on your pizza? And the answer to that is inevitably, well, yes, I would like more cheese on my pizza unless I have to pay more money for it, and then maybe I'm not so sure. And that's one of the real challenges with just about all product design and development is that in most mature products, adding features or functionality comes at a trade-off, and that trade-off is price. And so when we do discovery research, qualitative research, or even some of the conventional quantitative research techniques, 
What's really hard to get at is those trade-offs. And I was exposed to that first early in my career. You know, a lot of you know I was in the automotive industry, and we would do these kind of entry-level cost car quant studies. And you talk to people who are Chevy Cavalier owners, and you say, well, what do you want in a the car? They would say, boy, I really wish we had ABS brakes or AM, FM, you know, stereo CD changers. And uh, all these features that were really high level, people had a very hard time sort of describing what it would take to kind of describe that trade-off. And so that's one thing that Conjoint can do particularly well is can help you with trade-offs. Um, another thing that we can do really effectively with Conjoint is we can segment the marketplace and we can target at specific people. And that's one thing that we sometimes forget. We tend to treat marketplaces and users as if they're all homogeneous, as if everybody has the same interests. And that's why I really believe the answer to the blender problem, there is no one right answer. If you're trying to market blenders to student groups, you can sell a lot of blenders that'd be very effective and make your company a lot of money selling blenders that are going to appeal to students. That's a very different demographic than selling blenders to a, a married couple. So targeting specific populations and coming feature sets that make sense to people can really make a pretty big difference. And that's kind of my my quant or qualitative survey or conventional quant survey dilemma, we run these surveys and, and our, our natural bias is to look for the highest preference. And so you take a look and say, okay, what's your preference for a car? Well, 0.5% of the people in the world might prefer a Ferrari, 1% might prefer a Land Rover, 13% are going to prefer a, a, a Malibu. Actually, I think that's a Cobalt. But if you are a car manufacturer, that might be the right target. The right target might be to say, oh, there's only 0.5% of the people that, that prefer that, but they're really affluent, and I can make a lot of money selling to them. And we sometimes miss that nuance when we do conventional surveys. Well, most of the people ended up liking the Cobalt. Well, who cares what most of the people like? The real interesting thing is, what are the people we care about, we target? What are the people who our company's brands make a difference to? What do they care about, and how do we find those people? Finally, this is the thing you guys all grappled with, and this is uh, not that this data is necessarily from a blender survey, but it could be. As we increase the price of just about any object, the market share goes down. So we go from 75 to 85 to 95 to 100, 115, the price begins to go down. And so you might say, well, gee whiz, that's, you know, I should keep the price lower because the lower I make the price, the more I'm going to sell. And selling more sounds like a good thing until you lay on top of that profit. <laughs> And the fact of the matter is, as you raise the price, you might be selling less, but you're making more on every one you sell. And this curve here is really typical for a lot of products. Okay? The, the volume is going down, but my profit is going up until some magical point where suddenly increasing the price is dropping the volume faster than my ability to recover. And the real challenge is, can I find that spot right there for whatever my feature set is? These are all things that Conjoint does really, really well. So how does it work? You guys all took the survey. But here's the basic premise that was founded in, or, or fostered first in 1964, in a mathematical paper. And they said, look, we got these really complex products we're looking to buy, things like that, right? But the reality is how much that appeals to you is really the sum of individual features. We add those things up. So let's assume, for the case of this example, and this is simplified, that you only really care about three things when you're buying a car. Fuel economy, price, and brand. Now the reality is more complicated. Smoothie criminals is also selected modern, which is not a choice for style. Temporary. Temporary. Thank you. Sorry. No you can throw, uh, <laughs> throw all the, the, the blame at me. So we have, let's assume you're looking at a car and you care about fuel economy, price, and brand. And the, the, the beautiful theory is that what people came up, they said, geez, when you look at this car, what it really boils down to is how much do you value that particular fuel economy? How much do I value that particular price? How much do I value that particular brand? If I add those all up together, that equals how much I value that particular vehicle. And so when I take a look at these trade-offs, I'm thinking of either buying an Insight or a Prius. What I'm subconsciously doing is I'm saying, oh, Honda, that's a good brand. I like that. Toyota, I don't know if I trust them as much anymore. But the Honda's $18,000, that's a little bit less. That's good because the Toyota's more money. 
I really like the fact that the Toyota gets higher gas mileage and the Honda's getting, those are really, really compl complicated heuristics. Your brain is kind of mentally processing those things. You're not really cognizant of what you're doing, but in the end, you're going to come up with a preference between those two. And the theory is subconsciously what you're doing is trying to assign values or words for those particular features. And so the real theory of conjoint is that the consumer is using some internal subconscious point system that they're not aware of and aren't able to articulate that says, okay, I'm going to assign 40 points to the Prius because it gets better mileage than the 30 points I assign to the inside. I'm going to assign 15 points to the Prius because it's more expensive, and the Honda gets 25 points. And I like the Honda brand more, so I'm going to give that 20 points and 10 points to the Toyota, which means that the, the, Honda, or the, the Honda wins. It's got 75 points. So the, the problem, of course, is that none of us are able to articulate this, right? I mean, there's like, is, none of us even know that we're aware of doing that. There's no way to say, well, Nick, what's your point value for dollars? There's no, no mathematical way to do that. So what is conjoint really? Conjoint is kind of the secret decoder ring to our internal part words. <laughs> so traditional surveys, we know we can't get at that. So if we were running a traditional quant survey, we would take each one of these attributes and we would try to, on a scale of one to five, how important is fuel economy? You know, you, you've all taken surveys like that. We might even try to get some biases, you know, what's more important to you, or <coughs> rank your top five. We try to get at that subconscious ordering system. What the people who invented conjoint did is a lot, I think, more clever. They basically just show you opportunities. They say, which one do you like? That's as simple as it gets. Do you like this one, or do you like that one? Here's the feature set. Pick that out. We're going to do that, I don't know, maybe 8, 10, 12, 20 times. Show you what those are. And then we're going to take your results and we're going to shove it into a very fancy computer program that's going to do linear regression analysis on that. And it's going to attempt to build a mathematical model which teases out that point system from the way in which you picked your values. So Jeff's filled out the survey. We know that he chose the Toyota over the Honda, but he chose the, the uh, Hyundai over the Toyota. We picked all those out. We can go in with the computer and we can keep adjusting the point values for all those features until we get a mathematical model which duplicates as close as possible the way in which Jeff picked his features. We've essentially built a mathematical model that can predict for any feature set we show Jeff how he would choose that. <coughs> 